Welcome everyone, this is Amir Mushtaq from U Council. Today we'll talk about mediations in a civil action in Ontario. We'll cover some basic topics, basic concepts about mediation and how do you go about scheduling and attending one. We will begin with our usual disclaimer that this course is not legal advice, so if you have any specific questions about your issue, you must contact a lawyer or a paralegal or law society of Upper Canada. We'll cover the topic of what is mediation, we'll explain uh, when the mediation is mandatory and how do you schedule and attend the mediation in Ontario. So mediation essentially is an opportunity for parties to resolve their dispute without actually going all the way to trial and you do that with the help of a neutral third party um, who can help you figure out your issues and see if there are any common grounds and then help you resolve that dispute. Mediation could be mandatory or could be voluntary. With respect to voluntary mediation, uh, regardless of the nature of your dispute, you can actually, uh, if parties agree, if you and the other side agree that a mediation is a good idea, you can always schedule a mediation and then attend that. Uh, but in certain cases, the mediation is mandatory in Ontario. So let's talk about which cases are those in which the mediation is mandatory. Uh, this is defined in Rules of Civil Procedure, specifically Rule 24.1, which talks about mandatory mediation. And when you go through that rule, you will understand that mediation is mandatory in actions that are commenced in Toronto, Ottawa, or in Essex County. So these are the three areas where mediation is mandatory. Let's look at the rule quickly. Rule 24.1, uh, mandatory mediation, it's in Rules of Civil Procedure. I just Googled rules of civil procedure Ontario and I get this um, and then this talks about mandatory mediation um, you will notice that this is the application of this rule and it says the uh, mediation is mandatory in city of Ottawa Toronto Essex um, and then there are exceptions to that so mediations that are commenced uh, the court actions that are commenced or applications that are commenced under rule 75.1 which is a states states litigation and states matter so uh, that are that are not covered in here um, the other matters are the matters that are on commercial list, uh, construction liens matters, uh, bankrupt bankruptcy and insolvency matters under bankruptcy and insolvency act. So there are certain exceptions to um, the actions that are not covered under this rule, but most of the actions, civil actions that are that are commenced in uh, Toronto, especially in Toronto, Ottawa, in Essex, they are required. Um, they are covered by the mandatory mediation rules. Okay, um, and so as I said, the mediation is voluntary in any other case and in any other jurisdiction and it's up to the parties to see if they see the value of attending at mediation and then scheduling one. Who is a mediator? A mediator, as I said, is a neutral third party. It's a person who is not a judicial officer. A mediator uh, does not work for the government, does not work for the Ministry of Attorney General, does not work for court. He, is, um, he or she is a non-judicial officer Generally speaking, retired judges sometimes become mediators, uh, retired lawyers, they become mediators. Uh, a lot of practicing lawyers, senior practicing lawyers, um, also practice mediation in addition to their own practice, law, law practice. And then some of the non-lawyers um, are also mediators. These are individuals who have significant expertise in legal matters, um, may, maybe have doctorate degrees in, in law, but do not uh, practice law or may not be lawyers um, in, in, the, in the law society of Upper Canada. So the requirement to become a mediator is, is not that you have to be a lawyer. I think it's the ability uh, to bring parties together. That's the crucial aspect of uh, you know, the crucial function of the mediator. Um, now, just from experience, um, non-lawyers, when they're dealing with lawyers, you know, it's such a, such a sort of territorial thing. Uh, that it's sometimes it's hard for non-lawyers to sort of break into the mediation world and be successful um, because of the nuances of issues because of how the parties act but the the doors not closed and I know a number of uh, mediators who are not lawyers um, and, and are good mediators how do you select a mediator um, you can go back to rule 24.1.08 uh, and that talks about how to how do you select mediator and I'll sort of briefly tell you uh, what that rule states uh, first of all you can agree to parties have to agree to a mediator and and they can agree to a roster mediator a roster mediator uh, a roster is a list of 
mediators that is held by mediation coordinator which is a function at the uh, at the court and that that list has a number of names and you can look up that list i believe it's available online too you can look up that list uh, find a suitable mediator and and all parties need to agree that that person will mediate and that's how a mediator is selected that's one one way of selecting a mediator another way of selecting a mediator is that you agree uh, or parties agree to a mediator who is not on the roster of mediation uh, mediator mediation coordinator um, and so and even then that person can be uh, selected as a mediator in fact most of the mediations that i um, attend in my practice um, uh, i think 90 99 percent of our mediators are not on the roster uh, these are private mediators and and they get retained by parties simply because they are well known they are well respected and and it's easier for parties to agree on a non-roster well-known mediator so uh, but having said that there's there's not much difference uh, all mediators are equally good with with respect to their function some know how to resolve disputes better than the other but that's a skill or it's an art um, not, hasn't much to do with the person's uh, legal knowledge or legal background um, third option is appointment by uh, the mediation coordinator. So this happens when parties are unable to agree uh, on, a, on a specific mediator and, and you know one party proposes certain mediators, the other party rejects them um, and, and, and vice versa. And then at that time one party writes to the mediation coordinator at the court and says can you appoint a mediator and then the mediation coordinator is appo appointed. So it's kind of imposed by the mediation coordinator. Now, how do you schedule mediation? Uh, again, it's Rule 24.1.09, um, and it says that after the la after the first defense is filed, you have 180 days to uh, schedule a mediation. Let's quickly look at that rule so you are clear how a mediation is scheduled. 24. Point a mediation session 24.1.09 sub 1. A mediation session shall take place within 180 days after the first defense has been filed unless the court orders otherwise. So why it says first defense because there could be multiple uh, defendants and when the first defendant file um, his or her defense then the clock begins and then within 180 days you have to schedule a mediation so uh, there's a timeline and and parties must follow that and there are extent exceptions to that timeline and and that's provided further down in the in the rule um you know one of the instances could be where it's it's better to have mediation conducted after the examination for discoveries are done or there is another reason why the mediation should be delayed and that opportunity is there but principally the mediation must be conducted within 180 days of um of when the first defense is filed. In my practice in employment law, we are generally able to um, get a mediation date uh, even sooner than that, sometimes in three to four months, depending upon the availability of parties and, and the choice of mediator. Um, with respect to location, normally you, you, you schedule mediation at a neutral location. These are owned and operated by third parties. A lot of court reporters in downtown Toronto and elsewhere, they provide uh, location that is available and then you can book that location. Um, you can also attend mediation at the location of one of the parties. It is not uncommon um, um, and, and as long as parties are satisfied that it's not going to impact the actual conduct of mediation, then uh, for cost saving purposes you can actually attend mediation at uh, another party's location. Then you have to decide how long the mediation should be. Should it be half day, full day? Depending upon the nature of dispute, um, you schedule uh, um, the, the appropriate time. In uh, in majority of employment law cases, half day mediation, which is up to three hours, is usually sufficient and the matters usually get resolved if they get resolved. And if not, then uh, there's no point spending longer than that. Uh, but in some instances, a full day mediation is better and so parties can go ahead and and, and schedule a full day mediation. You have to keep in mind that mediation, scheduling mm -hmm. of mediation, selecting uh, the mediator, the cost of mediator, the cost of venue, all of these are shared by parties equally. So uh, if there are uh, you know, two or three parties in a dispute, then all of them will share the cost of the mediation. And that's why um, the cost of the mediator and the cost of location or venue plays uh, at times a role in deciding 
uh, which venue to, to attend and, and which, which mediator to select. Uh, a mediator generally, uh, sort of in an employment law cases, um, can uh, mediators cost could range from a thousand dollars to you know three thousand dollars or more uh, for a half day mediation. So half, if there are two parties, then the cost could be half of that for each side. Um, with respect to now, the mediation is scheduled, the venue has been chosen, um, and another step that you have to do is you have to prepare a mediation brief uh, and send it to the mediator and to the other side. And mediation brief is really uh, sort of your argument why uh, you should be given uh, the remedy that you are seeking against the other side. It's a, it's a bit of an argument, it's a, it's a bit of a background of the facts so that a mediator can get a sense of what the issues are and he or she can make up his mind about how to, how to go about resolving this dispute for, for the parties. Rule 24.1.10, again, it's in the Rules of Civil Procedure. It provides that parties must, must provide statement of issues. Statement of issues is essentially, you know, what is this case about? What are the issues that uh, will be decided at trial? And what is each party's position about those issues? Uh, you should also send a copy of your pleadings, which are, you know, statement of claim, statement of defense, reply to the mediator so the mediator can read those pleadings and get a better sense of what the case is about. Um, similarly, you should send other documents. If there are important uh, documents that help your mm -hmm. case, then you should also include those documents uh, along with mediation brief so that mediator can look at some of the evidence that is helpful um, in understanding your position and the corresponding evidence supporting that. With respect to attendance and mediation, uh, an important part is that Parties who have authority to settle their dispute must attend or at least be available by phone. Um, majority of the mediators require the, the person who has the authority to settle to be physically present at mediation. And, and that's just because um, it, once you're physically present at mediation, you understand what's happening. You are, you, are, you are witness to what's going on and then you are able to make decisions better. If you are offsite and only getting uh, information through your lawyer, um, then you may not fully understand, fully grasp what the mediator, uh, mediator's uh, suggestions are, what are the reasons for mediator proposing certain things. And so you miss out an opportunity to properly settle a case because you're not physically present. But in any event, the requirement under the rules is that the, the person who has the authority to finally say yes to a settlement should at least be available by phone uh, to, and to confirm the settlement. Um, all the discussions that happen in mediation are confidential, they're without prejudice. And the idea is that you can openly speak your mind um, at mediation with hopes that the matter could get resolved. So um, if you are if you're discussing something that can can harm you, your case at trial, um, you don't want to hold back at mediation uh, just so that you know you you could be harmed later on. So uh, the idea is you can have an open, candid discussion at mediation and see if the dispute could get resolved, and therefore all the uh, the communication at mediation is considered without prejudice and confidential. Um, with respect to attendance and mediation, I often tell my client to to not come to a mediation with a fixed mind because if you have a fixed mind about your case and and you're not willing to be flexible or move from your position, then the purpose of the mediation um, you know loses its value. Uh, the mediation loses its value. So you have to have some open mind because you are attending mediation, you will hear, perspective from the other side, which may not be that obvious from the pleadings. Uh, there are certain background facts that are not that clear in the pleadings. And so at mediation, you are hearing some information uh, through the mediator that you may not have known about or motivations of the other side for doing certain things that you may not know. And all of that uh, could change your mind and should change your mind at mediation. So you should have some open mind um, at mediation. That is not to say that you um, completely fold your position, but have some open-mindedness so that you can understand the other party's position better. Um, mediators have different roles and different styles. Mediator's job primarily is to help parties to resolve this matter. So they will um, they will listen to your case. They will point at deficiencies in your case. Uh, they will do the same exercise in the other room with other uh, party, look at their case, point out the deficiencies, 
um, make some suggestions. Uh, some some mediators are, um, are are too involved in in all of this process. They are a bit more aggressive. They will take you the, to task if your arguments have no validity. Some mediators are more sort of um, you know laid back in that sense that if you are making an argument that does not make sense, they will raise it but not sort of confront you. Uh, so every mediator has different style, but their function is the same. All of these mediators are trying to resolve the dispute. Uh, between parties so that they can save their money and costs and get a resolution that you know the the parties have control of as opposed to when you go to a judge and the judge decides at trial then parties have no control in terms of what the decision will be so mediators function is to emphasize that parties have the control uh, in, in, in carving a dispute that is acceptable not the best solution but acceptable to parties so they can move on so that's the mediators role and they have different styles what parties uh, when they're attending they should keep in mind that the discussions that are happening in mediation the settlement offers they're going back and forth they're not in a vacuum they are they are based on a certain legal framework and you will hear that from the mediator what that framework is from your counsel what that framework is um, and then in the context of that frame the cases are settled Normally at mediation, um, j just so you know how physically um, the, the parties are distributed, um, each side is in a separate room. Um, if you and your lawyer will be in one room, the other party with their lawyers will be the, in the other room, and the mediator will go back and forth between the rooms, uh, take the offers, come back with the offers, counter offers, and try to resolve it. Because if you put all the parties in one room and they all are um, you know, hard uh, settled on their positions, um, then it's hard for, for, for parties to come to an agreement. So it's sometimes it's better to keep them apart and let the mediator do his or her job to sort of uh, try to resolve the matter. Um, sometimes some mediators have this style that at the opening of mediation, they have a joint session in which all parties are present, in which the mediator explains the process and, and hears uh, briefly from the parties. And usually that mediation session doesn't last more than 10 minutes. Uh, but the real uh, stuff about mediation begins when the parties are sent to their separate rooms and the mediator goes back and forth and tries to resolve the dispute. Keep in mind that mediator has no power to award any uh, judgment. The mediator's role is simply to facilitate. So mediator cannot impose a resolution on any party. It's a non-binding process um, where the mediator will make suggestions. And what you want to keep in mind is that uh, a mediator's suggestions are are very very important because you have received opinion from your lawyer the other side has received opinion from their lawyer and a mediator is a person who is neutral who doesn't care about the outcome of your case who has no stakes in your case and who is a senior lawyer or a senior judge or a retired judge who has his or her own views about your case based on the information that um, they have received from you and they will provide an opinion to you and that opinion um, should be taken seriously because it's an opinion of a person who is not your lawyer but who is you know as close to a judge as you can get before you actually go to a trial so you take that opinion seriously whether you accept it or not it's, it's your call but at least you should consider that the second part about the the opinion which I normally tell my clients is that even though the they should consider a mediator's opinion seriously they should still take it with a grain of salt because the mediator's ultimate job is to get a resolution so a mediator may uh, put his or her opinion a bit aggressively a bit too strongly um, and so but at least you have that information and you can discuss with your lawyer um, in more detail the points that mediator has raised so that if there is another opportunity to resolve that matter later on you can keep those points in mind so what happens uh, if, your, if your case settles, and, and in the majority of cases it does, uh, cases do settle, so your case is settled, now you have to do some paperwork, and that paperwork involves you know, preparing minutes of settlement, which basically states what are the uh, terms and conditions of the settlement, what is the agreement, it's, it's uh, reduced to writing, parties sign it, and then if there are releases, one party is releasing the other, or there's mutual releases, those are prepared and signed so that the media, so that the the settlement is actually put in writing, it's signed, and and uh, and the and the documents are binding. So that's the the end of the mediation process when a settlement occurs. And obviously, if the settlement doesn't occur, then you move on to your uh, matter going further towards pretrial and trial. What is the conclusion? 
uh, you, what you should keep in mind is that mediation is a very valuable step. Um, majority of the cases do settle at mediation and, and, and in employment law situation I can tell you that over 95% of the cases do actually settle at mediation. So mediation is a valuable step um, and you should put in some effort in, in attending at mediation and making sure that you understand all the arguments. And also you want to keep in mind that the value of mediation is, is with respect to cost benefit analysis too. Uh, by the time parties get to mediation, the costs are not significantly high. And so as soon as you're out of mediation, your costs can spike really uh, significantly. And so there may be value in, 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 in resolving your dispute at mediation. I hope this gives you a sense of what a mediation is about. When do you uh, attend mediation and how do you attend mediation with respect to your mindset and your strategy? If you have any questions or comments or if there's anything further that you would like us to cover with, with respect to mediation or any other topic, please do contact us and we look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Thank you.